Okay, so my name is Greg Fisher. I'm an assistant professor at Indiana University, the Kelly School of Business. And I study um, a range of different issues related to entrepreneurship, social change, um, uh, entrepreneurial action, and so on. So this paper, the genesis of it, goes back to a conference where myself and, and the two colleagues who are co-authors on this paper were sitting. We were having a cup of coffee one morning, and it was a time just after the BP um, oil spill. And we were intrigued by corporate actions in response to social activists, essentially, and, and the sort of this interface between activists and corporations. And, and uh, it was a time when Toyota's cars were accelerating way too fast and, and there were activists coming in and trying to cause them to do different things. Apple was under scrutiny for labor practices. And so just intrigued by that relationship. And that prompted us to say, what or how could we investigate that a little more? And uh, we were sitting around um, and we came up with a list of different corporates, uh, uh, corporations that were sort of under scrutiny from activists. And um, as we looked at it a little more uh, and, and looked at, at different activist organizations and different corporations, so we became intrigued by the Rainforest Action Network and some of the work that they had done to create real change in certain industries. And one of those industries happened to be um, the home improvement retail industry. And so it was a matter of being intrigued by what was happening in this space and then looking for a, uh, a, a, a set of, uh, of, of circumstances in this space that would allow us to, to essentially research this a little more. Uh, our research evolved from the point of saying what data is out there that we might be able to utilize to understand how activists create change in corporations. Um, and so we, we, we literally try to find everything we could on what RAN had done to create change within the oil industry, within the home improvement retail industry, within the, the logging industry. And... Um, we initially just, you know, took down all their uh, uh, press reports from their website. We um, collected all the all the media reports on on what they had done, um, and so over time we sort of created this database of articles and uh, 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 qualitative data sources, qualitative data materials from different sources. And began putting that all together in a, in a chronological kind of way. And then the real boon for us, or the real opportunity for us, came when, when, when I discovered that the Bancroft Library at uh, the University of California, Berkeley, had boxes of old RAN archived documents. So we could essentially get everything that they had um, uh, created and utilized in their efforts to try and convince, in this case, it was the home improvement retailers to change the sourcing practices that they would employ um, uh, to, uh, that, that they would employ to, to, to source wooden products. And um, uh, so, so we, we created, utilizing initially publicly available data and then this sort of unique data source of archived documents at uh, the Bancroft Library um, uh, to create this, this, this long process oriented sort of narrative of what had happened um, in this setting. And so uh, uh, that, that's, that's really the story behind the data. And there's an interesting little tidbit to that is that um, none of us really wanted to fly out to, uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to the University of California at Berkeley. And we, we, could, we didn't have the funds to do it and so on. And so we just got onto Elon's and we found someone on Elon's who was also a researcher. She was based in Berkeley and we gave her very, very strict instructions via Skype um, as to what um, we needed, and she went because you could you could only get the documentation if you went into the, into the actual special uh, special collections library. She went in and she spent three days in there sifting through all these documents for us, making copies of of every single one that would be valuable for our research, and then sending us this mac massive package via UPS so that we would have uh, all the documents at our fingertips. 
that's essentially what it boiled down to. Um, and and we landed up having each having our own copy of this 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 big data set of of qualitative data that we could then utilize from that point onwards. So ultimately, what we became intrigued by was the language that um, the Rainforest Action Network used over time in its interactions with Home Depot as a starting point and then a whole range of other home improvement retailers thereafter. Um, so we, we, we became intrigued by the way they invoked certain rhetoric and language in order to bring about social change, in order to um, firstly uh, uh, con create a context within which to begin to talk about change. So um, initially it was just about stating out the facts, uh, laying out the problem, rationalizing why this is a problem. Um, and then over time, they, they became much more aggressive uh, about dramatizing that problem so that it became a much bigger issue. And then actually about uh, stigmatizing the corporation in question and, and at the same time incentivizing them to change. So we became intrigued by language over time used by social activists to create change within corporations. Um, and part of the reason we were interested in the language was because we had this access to this, this first-hand um, uh, sort of writing that they were doing, um, and uh, both public language and private language. And in fact, that was once part of the story. What, what went on in the public eye and what went on behind the scenes in the review process, that all got um, worked out. Um, but uh, uh, we had both both what the public was seeing in the media and what was happening in private in the letters back and forth between these these different parties. And so it boiled down to a story about language, to a story about rhetoric, to a story about what was being said in the setting in order to invoke change and then and then allow that change to diffuse more broadly. Well, institutional entrepreneurship is this notion that um, uh, certain actors can behave in, entro in, in, in entrepreneurial kind of ways to create institutional change. And so institutional change being something that you're, you're fundamentally changing what we accept as, a, as an institution or as a way of doing things in society. And, um, and the, the actors that come in and do that have over times coming for out of institutional theory being labeled institutional entrepreneurs. And over time, we've to some extent been able to marry some of the more traditional entrepreneurship kind of literature with the institutional literature to better understand this idea of institutional entrepreneurship. So it's not entrepreneurship in the traditional sense of creating a venture to create economic value. It's more about a, 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 an organization, often an under-resourced, um, under uh, low power kind of organization, using a variety of different mechanisms to create institutional change. And that's what has over time been called this idea of an institutional entrepreneur. So this research has a number of different implications. Um, the first implication is for entrepreneurs who want to create change in the process of building up new businesses or new industries. So if you think about Elon Musk, for instance, and Tesla, he's not only having to build an organization, but he's essentially having to create a whole lot of institutions around electric cars and electric motor vehicles and, and uh, uh, sta recharging stations and, and so on, and having to bring a whole lot of other actors, existing corporations and new ones on board to do that. And I think this lays out, this paper lays out some of the sort of rhetoric and framing over time that can be utilized for someone who's in that sort of position. So um, beginning with a, a contextualization of what's going on, what's changing, what do we need to be paying attention to, dramatizing that to some extent, and, and in some instances creating a moral imperative around that change. And that's sort of the first stage of language that gets used to set the scene. And then for someone who's in that sort of position, then um, uh, recognizing how they might um, incentivize or stigmatize and or stigmatize others so that they are 
have, have got some reason to now change. It's not just out there and something they feel they should do, but they're pushed a little, a little further to do it. And that can be done through, through some of the language we identify here. And then finally, um, formalizing all of that. So uh, 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 co-opting, creating mechanisms to co-opt uh, others, a broader group of actors and bring them on board and, and, and putting those that do change on a pedestal so that you create in, um, incentive for, for more and more people to change. So I think for entrepreneurs creating new industries or new, new, new settings, um, this kind of idea about what language are you going to use when has um, uh, major implications. And then the same can be said for, you know, many social entrepreneurs who are coming in and trying to create social change in industries, um, understanding this, th that, that this doesn't happen overnight, that you often need to convince bigger, more powerful actors to make certain changes and how you can use language over time in order to do that by, number one, contextualizing the problem, number two, eliciting uh, uh, and incentivizing others to support, and then number three, formalizing what they actually do um, so that others can pick up and do that. So certainly for, for, for entrepreneurs creating new industries, for social entrepreneurs, and then for industry activists or institutional entrepreneurs, as we call them in the paper, it, it has um, implications for how they behave.